Hello, Jerry. What a privilege and honor to have you here. And thank you so much for taking this time. It's um, a pleasure for me to do it. Jerry, you've accomplished everything. You have a very productive life and you're deeply respected in the music world. I was just wondering if you could share your music journey and your story. Well, as far as my musical career is concerned, I think my greatest asset has been my lack of imagination. And um, I've just never been distracted from the, the idea of playing the piano as well as possible. There was one time in my life, only once that I remember, when I asked myself, do I want to be a pianist? I had graduated from college where I had been a French major, but I, I, was, uh, I was studying with William Capel, going to New York for lessons. And um, around the time, uh, shortly after my graduation, Capel, as you probably know, was killed in, a, uh, in an airplane accident. I had to ask myself then, what actually did I want to do? Because I loved academic work. And in those days, it was quite easy to, to I could have gone on, gotten a, a doctorate in romance literature and gotten a position in the university. And I loved universities and I, and, and I, I particularly loved libraries. So I asked myself, do I in fact want to be a pianist? And I had to think that uh, I, I couldn't imagine life without that. And you know, it's not, it's not a question so much of music. Of course it's music, but, but one can be, one can have music in one's life without being a professional musician. But that kind of commitment to, to being at the piano, and in particular, I have to say, to performing. Because when you perform, Thank you, I've just received a lovely cup from my lovely friend. Um, when, when, you, when you are on stage playing a, living through a, 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 a great piece of music, there's a kind of experience that you, ex that, that you have as, as the music comes out from you, bringing the music in a live form from oneself is such a marvelous experience. So I felt I couldn't live without that experience. And so I, um, I arranged my life differently and I got to New York where I studied at Juilliard. And, um, and then one thing led to another. I, um, after a couple of years at Juilliard, I applied for a Fulbright to Paris and I received it. And I thought, what do I want this for? I have everything I want in New York. And I turned it down. And as soon as I turned it down, I asked myself, why did I do that ridiculous thing? I always think of these things because you know, when I, when I see young people trying to make choices, it's so hard to make choices. And sometimes you do things and you don't really quite know why you did them. Anyway, I changed my mind and I reapplied the next year and uh, I again received it. And I went to Paris and um, where I studied with uh, Alfred Cortot. One of the accidental things in my life was that because I was always losing teachers because they were dying or, or, or other misfortunes. Um, I, I studied with a great many different people and several of the, those people were titanic figures. Uh, um, Cortot, of course, and Capel, of course, Steuermann at Juilliard. And um, previous to that, I, I, I loved very much Olga Samarov with whom I studied for only short time because she died just after I came to her. Anyway, I went to Paris and um, in one way I was very unhappy 
But in another way, I felt I could never leave anywhere else. It was a whole revelation to me. And um, I had a wonderful year. And I was essentially offered an extension of another year in Paris. But I had other thoughts. And they, they were, for one, that I didn't want to play for teachers anymore. And uh, two, that I wanted to get married. Um, my my uh, future wife, my girlfriend at the time, was going back to her home in Haifa, Israel. And um, so I joined her there. And when I got there, my future mother-in-law said, when I explained what my vision of life was, that we would get married and go to Paris and live happily ever after or unhappily ever after, um, my future mother-in-law said, what are you going to live on? And again, I think of this sometimes with young people because I was already 26 years old at this point, and I had no idea what I was going to live on. Well, uh, life and people came to my rescue, and I was offered a, um, a job teaching in Jerusalem at the Jerusalem Academy. So um, we, my wife, who was a pianist, was also offered a job there. And so we weren't married yet, but, but uh, we moved to uh, Jerusalem. She shared an apartment with her composer brother. And uh, after a year, we, we were married. And meanwhile, I, um, I did a lot of performing. And I brought something, I have to say, somewhat new to the, the Jerusalem scene, which was very serious and very old fashioned. And um, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, 1958. And I played a recital uh, at, the, uh, at the hall in Jerusalem. I remember my program very well. I started with the Bartok Out of Doors Suite. And then I played the Berg Sonata and then six Chopin etudes. And in the second half, the Hammerklavier Sonata. And uh, people had not heard such a concert, uh, such a program before. I wouldn't play that program today. And I don't think it's a good idea to start with the out of door suite. But, you know, this was 1958 and the out of door suite was hardly known. And um, uh, I made a real impression and that helped me very much. And I, uh, and um, I, I did a lot of performing in Israel and finally stayed there for three years. When my wife and I decided that it was time to go back to, to New York. So that's what we did. I had meanwhile played with the Israel Philharmonic under the great Austrian conductor, Joseph Cripps. And Mr. Cripps, who was engaged to conduct the New York Philharmonic, invited me to play the same piece that I had played with him in Israel, namely the Bartok II. Again, this was 1958. The Bartok II was, of course, not a new piece, but it, it wasn't really known to people in the way that it is today. And um, so that was wonderful for me. And, um, and um, Stukowski, with whom I had played before, asked me to do the Bartok second with him. I said, well, I can't, I'm doing it with the Philharmonic. So instead I did the Bartok first with him. And for some years, I played very much Bartok actually. And I still love extremely the, the music of Bartok. Um, well, one thing led to another and um, um, my life continued in rather predictable terms, uh, and uh, I became the father of two wonderful daughters, and now three grandchildren. And um, I did occasional private teaching, but I, I didn't think of teaching seriously. And I, I however, in uh, 1969, 
I played with the conductor Maurice Abravanel, who was the conductor of the Utah Symphony, as well as the director of the um, Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara, a summer institution. And um, Mr. Abravanel asked, told me that Leon Fleischer on, on the faculty of the Music Academy of the West was um, leaving he didn't say whether it was for a year or permanently. Um, and he said, so he needed a replacement. He said, do you know someone I could recommend? Well, I sort of saw where he was going, but I, was, I didn't say anything. And he said, uh, Gary cannot come. He'd asked Grafman and Grafman had said no. And then ra rather theatrically, he turned to his wife and said, he would be perfect, he, they spoke both of them in, in French accents. He would be perfect for the job if, if uh, he were not so young. And she said, he's not so young, how old are you? I was um, 36 or something. Um, and um, she said, you see? So anyway, that's how I got the job in, in Santa Barbara. And um, I was there for 52 summers uh, and um, it was, it was a very important thing in my life. And it was the, the only real teaching I did. Uh, and it, it gave me a, a summer home and it was wonderful in every way. In uh, 1990, my wife died of cancer. And um, the next year, or right after her death, perhaps not, Coincidentally, there was a certain emotional connection. I was invited to join the Juilliard faculty. And I thought I would teach only two or three students, but I was quite mistaken. It, that became a, 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 a wonderful career uh, situation. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm still at Juilliard, of course. I've been there for 31 years. And, um, and I've also, over the years, I've done a great deal of chamber music. One day, some people I knew came to me and they said, you know, we've started a festival in Sitka, Alaska. Would you like to come? And, uh, well, that was very exciting to go to Alaska. And I went there for uh, close to 30 years, I think. And, and um, uh, those were different parts of my home. And... I was asked to do courses at the Ecole Normale in Paris where I had studied with uh, Cordeaux and that was very rewarding for me to be, to be back at the Ecole Normale. And um, similarly, I go to Israel um, more or less every year or I did until the pandemic uh, and give classes there. So my life has followed a certain consistency of direction. And um, uh, to tie up what I'm saying, I've always been rather uh, unimaginative in, in imagining what I want to do because I've always wanted to do this, to, to play and to teach and teaching for me is very much an aspect of playing, just as playing is an aspect of teaching. And of course, it's, it's true that one learns so much from one's students by, um, by, by, by teaching them. I'm, I'm going to give a talk for you on Chopin. And many of the things I'm going to say are things which I've learned from students. So that's more or less my story. And you did a lot of uh... A literature, you're a very artistic person, you're well-rounded in every way. What are your thoughts for our young musicians? It's true that my uh, studies in French literature have been a great advantage to me musically, and I've been able to use a lot of that I learned in playing and in, in teaching. So 
if people ask me, well, how much does knowledge about various things, how much does it help in playing? My answer is this, the more talented you are, the less you need knowledge. But the more talented you are, the more knowledge can help you. In other words, you can do without having read a novel by Balzac, but if you bring your intuition and your, and your work to music and add to it, I find with, with students that if I ask them questions about harmony, sometimes they say, well, I studied that two years ago, as if harmony is something you pass a test on and then you forget about. But that doesn't mean they can't play very well. I do think that the more you know about harmony, the more you're able to apply it to what you're doing, the more it enriches what you're doing. It doesn't tell you necessarily how to play, but it opens up possibilities. So I do encourage my students um, to, uh, to have a, a, a broad culture, and, uh, and many of them do, actually. Could you share your approach on what we call music interpretation? How do you understand each time period and style and use it to reflect in your own performance? This is a very important and difficult question, actually. This is the great question, really. Uh, you might say the question is, what is the ideal performance? And superficially, the answer seems to be to play a piece exactly as the composer imagined it. Not as the composer played it, but as the composer imagined it. Now, we often say, oh, if only we had recordings of Mozart, we would know how to play this piece. But we don't. But we have recordings of Rachmaninoff playing his music. And we have recordings of Prokofiev and Bartok and Benjamin Britten and Poulenc and a lot of, a lot of uh, people, a lot of composers, we have their, their recordings of their own music. And some of those people are great pianists like Rachmaninoff, Bartok, Prokofiev. So you can't say, well, they, they weren't able to, to play their music well. Now, do we try to play Rachmaninoff the way he played it? Not at all. I don't know anybody who tries to play Rachmaninoff the way, the way Rachmaninoff plays it. Um, I used to, uh, years ago, when I was first teaching, I would suggest to students when they played Rachmaninoff that they, that they listen to his recordings of the concerti. And I found that their reaction was always, oh, it's so fast. Well, of course, that's the one thing you don't want from, from Rachmaninoff, his tempi are always too fast. But my point is this, not that we're wrong in not playing like Rachmaninoff, but that that is not what we want to do. Our aim is not to play the music exactly as the composer envisioned it. Our aim is to bring the music to life in the way that is most satisfactory to us. The music as it was written by the composer. Now, here I have a, I, I, I have an analog. There's a story by Jorge Luis Borges. Do you know that name, Borges? He was an Argentine writer of short philosophical uh, uh, literary pieces. This story is called Pierre Menard, the author of Don Quixote. And it's about an imaginary, that is a fictional writer named Pierre Menard, 
a Frenchman of the uh, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And his culture is described in considerable detail. It's the culture of the period. And he has a project, which is to rewrite two chapters of Cervantes' masterpiece, Don Quixote. He's going to rewrite these two chapters without changing anything, not a single punctuation, not a word, not a, not a syllable. But because his background and culture and soul are so different from Cervantes, he's going to give a new meaning to every word. Now, this is a, a conceit, of course, a brilliant one. But I think one can apply it to what we're doing. In general, I would say, we play exactly what the composer wrote, giving our own meaning to every note. We can't give the composer's meaning. You see, if we play a sonata by Mozart, it can't in any way have the same meaning as it would have if Mozart were playing it, because we know it, and it's it's from the 18th century, and it 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 it's immediately a museum piece. So we have to think of it differently. How does that philosophical concept, how does it work out in actual play? Well, we try to immerse ourselves in, in the music as it's written. Students sometimes say to me, can, can one do something different from what the composer has indicated? My answer is, yes, if what you're doing is better than what the composer has indicated. It's usually not. Does that, one student asked me, does that uh, apply to, to the notes also? Well, maybe, but we have to be very careful about that. When, when Ignaz Friedman plays Chopin Mazurka, Chopin Mazurka, he um, often adds notes, changes things around. It's wonderful. It's surely uh, playing that, well, I don't know if it would have pleased Chopin, but it certainly pleases everybody who, who loves Chopin's music. But this is very subtle. And of course, it depends on individual valuation. So, practically speaking, to the student, the first thing is not to listen to a record. That's the last thing or the thing not to do ever. I don't really mean ever, but, but particularly when you're learning a piece, don't listen to a recording. Learn it, absorb it, try to understand it. Bring it to life as richly as possible. As for style, this famous question, is it romantic, is it classical, is it uh, Baroque? Those are legitimate questions, but they're, they're, they're just constructs. There's no such thing as a romantic piece. I have uh, given talks on this question of romantic literature. And what I've done is to um, play a variety of excerpts and ask the audience, are they, are they romantic or non-romantic? And my idea, of course, is, is not to find the right answer, but rather to show that we use this word in different ways, perfectly legitimately, to mean, to mean different things. Um, I find that certain, certain qualities, 
satirical, for example, are not romantic. A piece by Satie could never be identified as romantic. But a piece by Schoenberg certainly can, if you defined romantic in a certain way. Is Nuage Glee of, of Liszt, is that a romantic piece? Well, it's from the romantic period. Aesthetically, it's not romantic. So, I would say, know about these scholarly concepts. Uh, the, famous, the famous three periods of Beethoven. But notice that Beethoven didn't know that he was writing in three periods. And that it's very, very often helpful to bring concepts, stylistic concepts, Backwards. Another thing Borges said was, every, every great artist creates his predecessors. And that to me means that when you play Beethoven, you can enrich your performance by imagining the way Schubert heard it. And when you play Mozart, you understand it through the, the ears of Beethoven. And when you play Beethoven, early Beethoven, it, when you play Opus 22, for example, it will help you to think of Opus 106, which is so similar. Well, it doesn't have to be. Opus 22 can be did it did it did it did it did it, and Opus 106 can be da 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 da. But, but you can get the same energy in, in both of them if you want it, just as Opus 12, the uh, violin and piano sonata can have the same energy as the Ninth Symphony if, if you wanted to. So what I'm answering you is, yes, be as faithful as you can to the score and try to find style, but try to find the style that fits the particular piece, not a style that comes out of a book. Do you have a few recordings that are extra special to you? Yes, um, of course I do. Um, my Bartok recording meant a great deal to me. My Three CD recording of the Anne de Pelerinage was a wonderful project. Um, my um, my complete Tchaikovsky concerti, the first, second, third, and concert fantasy, which really is never played. Um, that was a whole adventure, um, and. Um, it was very interesting to do the original version of the of the first concerto as well as of course of of the second um, a a recording which I made principally of the music of George Ruckberg meant a great deal to me um, I don't know if you know the name George Ruckberg but back in in the 1970s he was the most talked about American composer there was. He, he, everyone was talking about Ruckberg. Um, today, you don't hear his name very much, and I think that's a great pity. But um, I love his music, and I and I, I, I played. I made a recording of mainly of his music, but also of several other, um, including a little piece by Ned Roram, which he wrote for me. Uh, the my recording of the Rorum Concerto, I, I was very happy with also, and um, uh, and more recently, uh, the the um, Vision de la Men of Messiaen for two pianos, which I did with, with Ursula Oppens, um, meant a great deal. So uh, I'm I'm perhaps not answering your question because I'm I'm naming so many recordings, but uh, they they've all meant a lot to me. How do you keep your mental sharpness as such a 
level and that's your secret maintaining your technical ability which is uh, extraordinary in the last years of Elliot Carter's life I went quite a few times with Ursula to have tea with him and once we brought a young woman with us who was very anxious to meet Mr. Carter. He was at the time, I think, 102. And um, she looked at him and she said, well, what is it like? And he looked at me and he said, oh, one just wants things to continue, to have tea, music, talk, books, That is certainly the way I feel. And my secret is that I, I just continue doing what I'm doing. Um, of course, it helps to, to practice scales every day. And I, and I do most of the time. Uh, I have a scale and arpeggio routine, which I learned from, from Capel and, and which, uh, Sometimes I can't do it, but because I'm traveling or something. But um, and um, in life in general, I I I just like so much what I do, and I want to go on doing it. And I suppose I'm lucky biologically. But um, um, people ask me about my parents and genes, you know. But my father died when I was when he was 44, and so I. I can't blame him for my uh, my long life, um, and um, so I, I really don't have an answer for you. I mean, I, I have no secret. I I just do what I do, and I, and I'm happy with it. And of course, people are are very nice to me. I've always been treated very well by 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 people, so that that has helped a great deal. You've been such a gift. So thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to talk to you.